Good afternoon and welcome to our webinar, Education in the Long Run, which data are available. This is a webinar jointly organized by the UK Data Service in Celsius, the Center for Longitudinal Study Information and User Support. My name is Beate Lichtwald. I'm from the UK Data Service at the University of Essex and I'm very happy that today I will be joined by Wei Jun from Celsius at UCL. I will give the initial talk on data we hold at the UK Data Service on Education, Access and Support. And in the second part of the webinar, Wei will present on the ONS Longitudinal Study, Access and Research. But before we continue, I would like to make sure that you are all hearing okay. I will launch a poll to see whether everybody can hear okay. So you should now see on your screen, can you hear us, yes or no? Please, can you vote? Okay, it's in progress. Okay. So I think there is no problem with the sound and we can continue. Thank you very much. Let's start with the first part of the webinar with the introduction to data on education that the UK Data Service provides. Uh, I will give an overview of the data, access and support. But first of all, why a webinar on education? Well. Education is a key factor in shaping an individual's life chances. It not only determines later employment chances, but also living and housing conditions, nutrition and health, participation in social life, friends and partner options, and finally, the educational opportunities and achievements of our children. Education is commonly regarded as the key to remaining competitive in a constantly changing, globalized world, as it is the key to meet the demands of a knowledge-based economy. The UK Data Service holds a wide and rich range of data collections suitable to shed light on all sorts of education-related research questions, from key longitudinal studies to international microdata, government data and qualitative data collections. The roadmap for today's talk will be as follows. First, I will give a brief overview of what the UK Data Service is. So who are we? What is the UK Data Service? Second, I will highlight what longitudinal data on education are available via the UK Data Service. And third, I will show you where to find data, longitudinal data on education, where to find resources and help. Now, what is the UK Data Service? The UK Data Service is a comprehensive resource funded by the ESRC. It is a single point of access to a wide range of secondary social science data. At the moment, we provide around 7,500 data sets. However, uh, we do not only collect, preserve and disseminate uh, data, but we also provide support, training and guidance. Now, this is a website of the UK Data Service and I would like to show you the location of today's materials. So, once we are finished here, I will send the slides uh, to the communications team and they will upload the slides to today's event page. And today's event page, you find when you click on news and events and then select on the left hand side well, I, I assume you will look at it no, no earlier than tomorrow and that would be then past events and when you then click on the description for the webinar of today you will find um, at the very bottom a link to the slides and also a link to the webinar recordings. Now back to the UK Data Service. Who is the UK Data Service for? The UK Data Service is for academic researchers and students, for government analysts, for charities and foundations, for business consultants, independent research centers and think tanks. Our data sources uh, are official agencies and here mainly central government, so ONS. Also international statistical time series. We have data from individual academics, so from research grants. For example, if a researcher has an ESRC grant three months after completion of the project, one of the obligations of the researcher is to deposit the data with us for secondary analysis and to make it available to others. Uh, we have data from market research agencies, we have public records, historical sources, and also we have access to international data via links with other data archives worldwide or via networks we are involved in, and I will say a little bit more about that later on. The types of data collections we hold are survey microdata, aggregate statistics, census data, and qualitative and mixed methods data. The key data we hold are large-scale government UK surveys, 
surveys following individuals over time, so that as a longitudinal major UK surveys. International macro and microdata, qualitative and mixed methods data, census data, business microdata, administrative data, and also, and that's fairly new, controlled international microdata. I would like to start with the latter. And here um, I would like to announce that the UK Data Service is part of the International Data Access Network since 2018 short IDEN, and the IDEN project is a collaboration between six research data centers from France, Germany, the Netherlands, and the United Kingdom to facilitate research use of controlled access data between these research data centers and countries via reciprocal provision of safe or remote desktop access. The network will enable researchers to work remotely on controlled access data provided by partner countries. And I'm very happy to say that the UK Data Service has set up a secure data access point within the UK Data Service safe room here at the University of Essex to facilitate on-site direct remote access to the French Secure Access Data Center data from the UK. And I have provided a link here to the data so you can see the whole list. It would be too long to show you, but you can scroll uh, down the list. And also provided um, an address where to um, apply for data access. And just a very brief overview of the themes covered and the producer producers involved. But I just want to highlight here basically that um, lots of data sets have of course information on education, training and skills. Another safe room remote desktop access point we have uh, for the Institute for Employment Research FTZ or research data center. So basically another access point here at the University of Essex in our safe room is to, to the IAB, to the Institute for Employment Research in Germany. And again, I have provided a link here to the data sets that are available via the UK Data Service safe room. And I have also copied a small screenshot for you. And again, I just want to highlight one thing, and that's the National Educational Panel Study, NEPS, um, focusing on education particularly, and those data are available via our safe room here uh, at the University of Essex at the UK Data Service. There will be more later on. You have seen there are more countries involved, but um, this is very much work in progress. Now back to UK surveys. I know that today we are focusing on longitudinal data, however, also, the description um, of today's event contains information that we would touch on other than longitudinal data briefly. And that's what I'm doing now. So, UK surveys containing lots of information on education as well are, for example, the Labour Force Survey, the Skills and Employment Survey series, the British Social Attitude Survey, the General Lifestyle Survey, previously known as the General Household Survey, and the Integrated Household Survey. International data are available other than the controlled international data uh, which are subject to um, secure access conditions. So these are not that I'm presenting here on this slide. For example, one could look into Africa development indicators and look at the primary school completion rate of different African countries, for example. Or you can look into the OECD education statistics and, for example, try to find out what is the typical graduation age in tertiary education. And here, for example, the second stage of tertiary education is get six. And compare, let's say, United Kingdom and Germany, and you would find out that the typical graduation age in United Kingdom for that PhD level would be 24, whereas in Germany that would be 28. Now, qualitative mixed methods data here I just mentioned three, but I would like to highlight particularly the school leaver study. And you might look a little bit astonished at the date 1978. Well, why would that be relevant? Uh, I come to that in a minute. Basically, what has happened here is Ray Pal has asked uh, teachers at a comprehensive school on the Isle of Sheppey um, to ask their pupils uh, at the end of their school time to provide an imaginary account of their life over the next 30 or 40 years. And they ended up with 142 handwritten essays. And why that is of interest in particular for the longitudinal aspect of today's webinar is this exercise has been repeated in 2009 and 10. 
And again, 110 essays were collected and then coded and compared to the data across time. So that's actually quite interesting. And I'm not going into the details of what was found, but actually it was a really interesting uh, study, especially in this combination with a follow-up 2009 and 10, which wasn't planned originally. Now, coming to longitudinal data. Longitudinal surveys involve repeated surveys of the same individuals at different points in time. The advantage of longitudinal data over cross-sectional data, and I find its beauty, is that they provide the chance to look at the histories, not just point-in-time situations. Usually there are large samples, they are nationally representative, and on a regular basis new respondents are added in order to keep the numbers up and address the issue of attrition, which is a problem for all longitudinal surveys. Longitudinal data allow researchers to analyze change at an individual level, and they are usually a little bit more complex to manage and analyze, but they are definitely worth it. This slide I have prepared just in order to give you an overview of what sort of um, documentation one can ideally expect, because I think that's particularly beautiful here for BHPS on top, where you can easily see the different variables and in which waves you would find them, so you can easily see not all variables are obviously, in all waves. And at the bottom, there is a bit of the, of the user guide for the Millennium Cohort Study. And here, I just wanted to highlight the module character of the survey. So in uh, the first one, you have information from the birth records. In the second one, for example, medical records. In the third, education records. And in the fourth, teachers edit as well. So that's actually quite nice to illustrate how, how the composition is done. Some examples of longitudinal data. This is not a comprehensive list, but I just tried to cover a few very important longitudinal data sets, particularly with focus on education. Now, the first three are the famous um, birth cohort studies. So the 1958 National Child Development Study, NCDS, 1970 British Cohort Study, the Millennium Cohort Study, and then there's another one highlighted in green, which you can see further down the list. This is Next Steps, or LSYPE, Longitudinal Study of Young People in England, formerly known as that just recently joined the others at the CLS, the Center for Longitudinal Studies in London, and it actually fits in quite nicely in between the rather long gap between the 1970s British Cohort Study and the Millennium Cohort Study. Moving on, there's also the British Household Panel Survey, which is located here at the University of Essex at the Institute for Social and Economic Research. Its successor is the Understanding Society, and or also called the UK Household Longitudinal Study. And the, the latter is four times as big and uh, followed the BHBS who had 18 waves. But the British Household Panel Survey is part of Understanding Society from wave two. And uh, meanwhile, we also hold harmonized data sets which are really beautiful to analyze. I will also talk a little bit more about all of these studies later, but just to give you a first um, overview. We have Growing Up in Scotland, also very important for um, policy in Scotland. And finally, I've listed closer the cohort and longitudinal studies enhancement resources here on this slide. This is a website of the Center for Longitudinal Studies, and as you can see, here are the four national longitudinal cohort studies. And Three of them follow 17,000 or 19,000 young people born in a particular week of a particular year in Great Britain. And Next Steps follows the lives of 16,000 people in England born in 1989 and 90. And I have also provided a link here, a URL, where you can find podcasts related uh, to research based on these data sets. This is an overview of the sweeps. Uh, of all these British birth cohort studies and the uh, Next Steps uh, cohort study. And you can see here for NCDS we have 10 sweeps so far, and you can easily see when the next one occurs. So for NCDS that would be in 2020 at the age of 62, and uh, again in 2020 for BCS70, for uh, the respondents then being 50, et cetera, et cetera. So I think that's quite an easy overview. Also, in case you hadn't noticed, but um, I mentioned it before, that Next Steps is 
now managed by CLS was formerly managed by the Department of Education. Now this is an overview of the linked education administrative datasets, key stage one and two. And these are all secure access datasets. I will explain later what that means. But quite interesting here also, for example, study number A226, the Millennium Cohort Study of State Linked Data, 2006 to 2012 or on the right hand side all the different other linked education administrative data sets, key stage one and um, two. Moving on to understanding society. As I mentioned before, it is a very big and large longitudinal uh, study and it is now surveying 100,000 individuals in 40,000 British households. It has replaced the BHPS but it incorporates it and thus basically retains the longevity whilst adding to the sample size and adding to the scope of the study. So there are new components, for example, the innovation panel, and there's also greater detail available on ethnic minority groups and also qualitative and biomedical data collections are added. And I didn't mention that before, but also for the cohort studies, uh, biomedical data increasingly play a role and are added to the data sets and then linked with consent, um, obviously, to the data sets if possible. And that uh, enables fantastic new research also in relation to education. So the Understanding Society data linkage covers three types of data linkage and that is um, linkage to geographical identifiers and administrative data linkage and organizations. So here for example identifiers of the schools that children attend or recently attended. Now I have mentioned before that Understanding Society and BHPS data are harmonized and we have now uh, data sets uh, which have been harmonized and actually here the recent one is study number 6614 Understanding Society waves 1 to 8 2009 to 17 and the harmonized BHPS data set in one so basically that covers now from 2009 up to 2017 or basically including BHPS 1991 to 2017, so a fantastic longitudinal data set. This is a slide containing the overview of the data linkage phases that Understanding Society plans and you can see regarding education there are quite a few administrative uh, data sources uh, which are planned to be linked, to get linked to the data. And you can also see the status and uh, how the informed content collection went or is planned or when it has to happen. So that's actually quite a nice overview and I will not go into any more detail but if you want you can look at it later on. Uh, you know where you will find the slides and then you can inform yourselves about the details. Closer. The cohort and longitudinal studies enhancement resource aims to maximize their use value and impact both at home and abroad, so of all these studies they include. It brings together eight leading studies and CLOSER basically works to stimulate interdisciplinary research and develop shared resources, provide training and share expertise. And this way CLOSER is helping to build the body of knowledge on how life in the UK is changing both across generations and in comparison to the rest of the world. So the areas of work that CLOSER does include data harmonization, data linkage, research impact and training and capacity building. This is a very nice overview of the studies involved and also in a timeline. So you can see what started when and you will recognize a couple of studies I have highlighted before, for example the NCBS, the BCS, 1970, the MCS and Understanding Society, but also you can see here closer and I want to come to closer data sets. So the UK Data Service is quite pleased to announce the first harmonized data sets created by closer and they are now available to download. So these data sets harmonize body size and body composition variables for example across five of the uh, prestigious cohort studies of the UK, the MRC National Survey of Health and Development, NCDS, 1970 BCS, MCS and the Evan Longitudinal Study of Parents and Children. 
And I would like to quote Professor Alison Park here saying, as an experienced researcher, I know the huge challenges involved in creating harmonized data sets from different data sources and the importance of ensuring the methods used can be usefully exploited by other researchers. Longitudinal harmonization provides fascinating insights as to how the UK is changing over time and I'm delighted Closer is helping make this work easier. I can only agree with that and indeed it does. So here we have the data sets and you can see Closer Work Package 1, Harmonized Height, Weight and BMI and Closer Work Package 2 uh, includes harmonized socioeconomic measures in four longitudinal cohort studies and then we also have a Closer Training data set. Now, I would also like to mention the Growing Up in Scotland data set. It's a longitudinal research study and uh, they, this study tracks the lives of thousands of children and their families from the early years through childhood and beyond. And the main aim, as for most of the studies, is to provide new information to support policy making. And in this case, particularly policy making in Scotland. So, Birth cohorts for 2002 to 3 and 2004 to 5 and 2010 to 11 are collected and again they are also focusing on education as well as other aspects. And as other studies introduced before, they also ask for consent from parents to link data collected from them and their children to administrative data held by health and education authorities. More on longitudinal studies and their impact is available, but I don't have time to go into impact and uh, policy relevant research. If you want to know more about that, there is another webinar available in the slides and I have given the URL here where you can find all those. Now, how would you go about finding longitudinal data on education? So one option is you search using key data. So you click on get data on the left hand side, you select key data and then longitudinal studies and then you will present it with a list of longitudinal studies you can scroll down and select. Another option is you search by theme. For this you would go to get data, data by theme and then select education or you use the data catalog and you type education in the box and then you specify on the left hand side cohort and longitudinal studies and here you would get 410 results. Another option is instead of using studies, uh, you could use series. So again, you would on the left hand side give the topic and the data type, so longitudinal studies. And this time we are looking at series and then you get 22 hits. Another option is you look at variable and question bank. The, the option to look at variable and question bank um, is nice, but it is not complete. I would like to um, give you a little bit of a warning here. It's very nice to try it, but it's not comprehensive. And for that reason, it is not the first choice. But interestingly enough, you can here search, as it suggests, for variables. And I have just typed highest education in here to demonstrate what happens then. And I have specified on the left-hand side as a country or as country selected from the list, European Union countries, and I was presented with 18 results, and I have then sorted it according to the earliest date, so that would be 1995, and then I wanted to compare variables I found, so I have added certain variables to my variable basket, uh, circled in green. And finally, I wanted to see what's in my basket in order to compare the question texts of different variables in different um, waves and also different studies to see whether I could actually compare those variables on highest education. That's actually quite useful for your, for your um, analysis and research. Anyway, data access. Who can access the data? basically all registered users, however, which data can be accessed and the particular access conditions vary according to the user type, so whether you are from um, a UK higher education, further education institution or not, whether you are from the UK or not from the UK. Second, it also depends on the usage or the project characteristics, whether you uh, request the data for a commercial or non-commercial project. And third, whether 
the specific data access conditions attached to the chosen data show end user license, special conditions, special license, or secured up data access conditions, or even safe room access. We provide web access to the data, and for secure lab data, also remote access to our data. We have a few studies for safe room access only, so that's on-site access only, but uh, that's not the majority, so I'm not highlighting that too much here. Accessing data step by step, so you need to register with us. You then agree to an end user license, you select the data, you specify a project given maybe 30 words minimum describing your project and then you can either download the data if it's an end user license data set or if it's a special license or other data set then you would need to complete forms which you are then prompted. The same here on our website so basically everything is explained on our website step by step and the data access conditions that we have are end user license, special conditions, special license, secure lab data access conditions and for secure lab data access you will need to also um, attend a safe researcher training following um, an approval as a researcher and also you will then be given a password and a username. The end user license basically specifies that you do not share the data with anyone who is not authorized, that you use it just for the purpose that you have been granted access for and that you don't share your login details, obviously. A special license access, you have to give a little bit more detail, you have to apply for it, and obviously there's a higher risk of disclosure uh, attached to these data sets. So the institution with responsibility for the researcher also needs to ask explicit permission of the data owner to release the data to the researcher. And secure lab data access conditions are slightly different, so the data is not available for download. Access requires accreditation and also an agreement to the services user agreement and breaches penalty policy. The applications are screened and the individual or institution having ownership of the data um, or the designated authority have then to screen the applications as well and access is only granted to those requiring the data for statistical research purposes and who can justify their need for the data. However, we can assist with those applications and, and help you to succeed. This is how it works. You register, you order the data, you become an approved researcher, you complete the agreement, complete the training, receive your unique login, then you work remotely in the SQL lab area, you will then ask for statistical disclosure control of your requested output. We will check it and then hopefully, if there's no problem, release it to you for publication. You can also explore the data online, for example, with Nesta, which is an online data browsing and analysis system. And this is how you find it. You go to Get Data, Explore Online and click on Nesta. And here is one example I have provided for you. What you could, for example, do in this case, I have used the General Household Survey, the time series data set, 1972 to 2004. And I have looked at, um, at the highest qualification and here just select a degree or higher. And you can see that you have the total numbers on, on the bigger, in the bigger graph, but in the right hand side bottom corner you find percentages and you can see roughly, hopefully, that um, in 1972 we had roughly 1% um, of the respondents having a degree or higher, whereas in 2004 almost 6.5% held a degree or higher. So that's actually quite positive. Here you find a couple of links and useful links to get started with Nesta and, and see how to go about using Nesta for your browsing. Finally, support and resources. Which support and resources can you find and expect from us? So we have video tutorials and webinars. We have student resources, for example, data skills modules. And in line with what we're talking about today, we uh, provide a longitudinal data module. You can see it in the little box provided and also the link to it. We have case studies available online, guides, themes, advice on managing and sharing data. We provide teaching data sets and resources particularly for teaching and we run a help desk and individual user support. Video tutorials you can find at Use Data Video Tutorials and then here thematic guides. Thematic guides can be found um, when you click on Get Data and Education. So then you find thematic guides on education. 
If you want to search all case studies, you would go to use data, data in use. If you want case studies based on longitudinal data, you would go to get data, key data, and then longitudinal studies. Further down, you find case studies relating to longitudinal studies. And if you want case studies using data on education, you would go to get data, education, and here you find case studies using data on education. And in the box highlighted in green, I have uh, just provided a few case studies on education, for example, titled Factors Associated with Academic Achievement, Exploring the Middle on GCSC Attainment, or How are Ethnic Inequalities in Education Changing? Teaching with data, I have mentioned that uh, we have lots and lots of resources on teaching. So if you go to use data, teaching with data, you find lots of resources at your fingertips there. Longitudinal teaching data sets, particularly you can go to our data catalog, type teaching data sets or the teaching data set, specify the data type, cohort and longitudinal studies, and you will be prompted a list or you go to get data. Data by theme, education, and again, here you find teaching data sets on the theme of education. Finally, if all this was too fast or not clear enough, you can go to frequently asked questions or to help or to contact. And then, if nothing else, contact us. Um, we have a telephone number, but we would prefer you to go to ukdataservice.ac.uk, help get in touch, and then select which of these online forms are appropriate for your purpose. We are also on Twitter, Facebook and YouTube and you can subscribe and I would recommend that to the UK Data Service emails, subscription list, gskmail.ac.uk etc etc and you will be updated about the newest developments. Now questions I don't think we do now. I would like to now hand over to my co-presenter Wei. So I'm handing over to Wei. Hi, um, my name is Wei Xun. Thanks for the invitation from the organizers to um, speak today. I'm from the Center for Longitudinal Study Information and User Support, um, Celsius for short. And we are based at um, UCL and we're funded by the ESRC as well. Um, so today I would like to talk to you um, about the, uh, the Office of National Statistics Longitudinal Study. Um, and uh, so I will go through um, quite briefly um, the structure of the um, longitudinal study. Um, I will refer to to that, that's the LS data for, uh, for short, um, and then what sort of educational variables we have in the LS, and then also a little bit about my own research um, into research, um, education, um, how it relates to um, economic activity in terms of working or not um, through the life course. Okay, so we start, sorry. Okay, <laughs> the slides are working now. So, um, so firstly, just a really general introduction into the LS. So, the LS is a, um, in effect, uh, what looks like a panel study that includes um, individual microdata from 1% um, of the UK population. Um, and this was um, established in 1974, and that includes uh, the census since 1971, so every census since 1971, we've had five waves of this, um, with each wave um, um, capturing over 500,000 people. So the sampling of the LS um, was based on birthdays, um, which means that is a random selection. Um, it's four birthdays out of 365 days a year. So this just about totals just over 1%. So because the um, sampling is based on the census, so all the information in each of the census um, are available. Um, there are also um, live events data that's linked to the um, members in the LS study, which I will talk about later on. So one of the very big advantages of using the LS data is that it's very large sample size, um, which enables people to do all sorts of comparisons or subgroup analysis or geographical based analysis in fairly small um, units, um, which we can talk about also later. 
Um, so here is a schema of, of, of the um, LS data. So if we start from the central spine where the white boxes are, so this tells you um, the, the dumple number, um, the, the numbers for 1971, 81, 91, 01, and 2011. Each census captures between 530 and 590,000 people, um, the dumple has grown a little bit um, just from census over time because we're actually getting more people in the UK. Um, so from 1971, each since 1971, um, the dumple members are linked back in at each subsequent census via the um, NHS um, central register. So each time uh, a new uh, a, a, a existing LS member appears at a subsequent census, they are linked back into the data set in this using a unique identifier that we give them. Um, so hence um, the sampling is fairly stable and we also have a dynamic sampling in the LS uh, in which people can actually enter by being born on one of the four birthdays um, in the year. So um, from 1971 to 2015, uh, we've had um, 325,000 new births and that's um, at the rate of since 2015 about 7,000 per year. You can also um, enter the LS through immigration which is a technical term in the LS and that's actually registering at the NHS register. So that's been 242,000 since 1971 to 2015 and that happens at about 9,000 per year. And with exit events, you can exit the study um, by dying. <laughs> We've had um, 280,000 um, since 71 and that's about 6,000 per year. And you can also embark um, and that's actually leaving the country. So the sampling actually stays really stable. Um, we've had um, births and deaths and entries and exits. Um, so we have, have been able to maintain a stable um, about 550,000 members per wave. Um, and then we also have linked um, life events. So we, I already talked about birth, death, and embarkation. We also follow up sample members if they have given birth, so that's for women, um, whether the infant uh, lived, um, so hence we have infant death. Um, we also have widowerhoods or widowhoods, um, as well as cancer registration. So all of this would would have been derived by either health or administrative records, um, again linked in via the NHS register. So next slide. Okay, so one of the um, very big advantage of um, the LS data is, is low attrition. Um, the census has been um, mandatory to fill in. So um, we have very few people who are not linked um, compared to you know most longitudinal um, studies that uh, possibly that have been mentioned before. So here is a diagram infographic that shows I think um, since 1971 each time so the, the members in 1970 original example that each time they appear census exactly. Um, what happened to them. So in 1981, you see actually um, from 530,000, we have 418,000 um, that are present. Um, 91, 352, um, 2001, 290, and 2011, 240. And you see in the pink circles um, where most people have gone, actually they have died. Um, this is Again, uh, something quite unique about the LS is that it includes, because its four birthdays are randomized uh, over the year, um, so it's calendar, day, and month. So the LS includes all ages um, and is completely representative of the UK population as census each time. So that um, we actually, if you look at 2011 at the end, almost 50% of the sample in 1971 have died. And the green example says immigration, and that means deregistration from the NHS Central Register. And the true attrition uh, in the orange circles right at the end is true loss to follow up. It's only around 10% after 40 years, 
and I think that's actually um, a very good number. Um, so what sort of information does LS contain? Um, so basically all information from the census um, are available in the LS. So that includes, you know, demographics, um, ethnicity, um, things like marital status, so social, um, social um, status, um, information, family composition, so where they were living, the drug geographies, um, what they were doing uh, occupationally, um, whether they were traveling to work. Um, in, so and more topics were added uh, in successive censuses, and now we're also recording um, religion, national identity, and passport language, um, intention to stay. Uh, now we also have um, limiting long-term illness, self-rated health, and also caregiving since 20, um, 2001. Um, I have already shown that um, the life events that are linked in to the LS include death, and that includes up to eight causes of death. Um, birth to um, LS members, uh, maternity events uh, to birth members, so live births, infant death, stillbirth, and also birth weight. And I think birth weight possibly was recorded up to 2015. Um, immigration and, and immigration, and again, that's to do with NHS registration, uh, with or opposed on cancer registration. So now I will talk to you about um, what sort of education information is present. Oops. So how do I go back? <laughs> Thanks. Um, in the LS. So um, as a rule of thumb, the best way of ascertaining what is available in the LS is to go to the census forms, which is what I've screen grabbed for you um, here. 1971. So we have two questions relating to education. So firstly, Question 13, have you obtained any of the following? So it talks about GCs, A-level, higher school certificate, and higher grade of well, Scottish hires, um, and also ordinary national certificates, um, ordinary national diplomas. Um, and question 14, uh, if you read the question, it says, have you obtained any of the following qualifications since reaching the age of 18? So these are um, the answers would relate to basically um, professional um, degree level um, uh, qualification, and here it gives you a list. Um, up to six of these are recorded, and unfortunately that's what's available in the data set is up to six post-18 qualifications. Um, in 1981, the question asks, have you obtained any qualifications after the age of 18? So it's fairly similar to 1971, question 14. So again, we would only know what up to six post-18 qualifications these people have had. Um, 1991, um, fairly similar. Again, it asks about after reach, reaching the age of 18. So we, again, would have um, post-18 post um, age 18 qualifications, but now there's um, more um, categories um, looking at um, degree and also professional um, qualifications. And up to here, you also know the um, institution or the institution for each of the qualifications. So in 2001, we have moved to a question that asks which of these qualifications do you have and tick all of the ones that apply. So now you can actually have um, different levels um, below age 18. So you can see here um, all levels, GCSE, A levels, a degree, and also then higher degrees and VQs. Um, it asks a separate question about professional um, qualifications. In question 17, again, it says tick all the boxes that apply. Um, the one caveat of this is that the question asks if you're age 16 to 74, so you lose the people who are aged over 74. Um, but um, the good thing about having this information now is that um, for people who have answered the questions in 71 to 91, you're able to retrospectively um, gain back, uh, uh, you know, kind of impute back the um, qualification levels they would have had in certain ages, and that's kind of um, what I've done in my study. Um, so in 2011, um, the qualification question has been combined into one, and now is asking um, those aged 16 and over um, all the qualification levels um, 
that's possible. Um, so again, it's possible to use this information to retrospectively impute um, education level below age 18 at earlier censuses um, provided that they appear. So we have um, at the LS um, website a, a derived variable um, code for um, uh, standardizing education for degree, non-degree up to 2001 and that just really needs to be updated um, to include 2011. So um, that has been done by some researchers that we've worked with in the past. Um, so, so basically with this information that is possible to compare um, cohorts of people um, over time. So you have five censuses worth and you also have all ages. So it's possible to construct many cohorts. So if you want to do time series comparisons, um, it's also possible to follow up an individual over time. Um, I guess um, most useful thing would be following up them over, um, you know, before the age of 35, before education actually gets um, um, solidified. Um, um, and also what's possible is to, um, sorry, I didn't mention this before, but you also have information about uh, those who are co-resident in the household um, at census. So that includes parents as well as spouses. So if you wanted to compare um, those people with education levels um, versus the um, LS member, so you can have inter intergenerational uh, mobility in education, or you can look at differences between spouses, um, and then you can actually ask some really interesting questions over time and generations and over um, people in the household, how that evolves. So now um, I will explain briefly how to access the ONS LS data. So we um, at Celsius um, handle um, basically all the front end um, interactions between us and users um, who are, can be um, anyone uh, in the um, UK. Uh, so once you're based in the UK, if you're academic, um, charity, gov um, government, uh, in, in individual researchers, um, as long as you qualify um, through the approved projects and approved researcher process, um, and you're able to um, access the data in a secure setting. Um, so we um, handle the process between inquiry um, and also all the way through to data outputs. So what we really encourage uh, users to do is to contact us at Celsius um, at ucl.ac.uk, our email address. If you have um, a potential research idea that you think you could explore using the LS data, we also have a wealth of information in training materials on the Celsius website, um, which is this link highlighted in blue here in the middle. Um, and as I already mentioned, so we provide support from inquiry to uh, application process, to the research approval, um, to constructing your data set. Um, so each project will get a tailor-made data set just to suit your needs. Um, we'll prepare this for you. We will um, also um, provide on-site some uh, limited on-site um, support while you are accessing the data. We also do remote access support. So this is for people because um, the um, safe setting, um, there are three at the moment, um, one in London, in Pimlico, in o &S office, and there's another one in um, Southampton, um, in, in Titchfield, in another o &S office, and there's another one in Wales. Um, so understanding that not all research can actually get to these safe settings, so we provide a, re a remote service um, by which the users will send us their uh, analysis scripts and we'll run them, um, generate output and clear those output to a um, acceptable disclosure um, level and then return those to you. So all of this process will be uh, supported by us. So now I will talk to you briefly about um, my own research. Um, so I, I realize I don't have a lot of time left. Um, so I, I I was looking at how um, basically how uh, em employment status um, lingers over the life course, and education was one of the variables I used. So 
very quickly, my example I picked from uh, 1971 and all of those aged 16 to 24, and I've tracked them forward 40 years. So each so each 10 year gap from say age 16 to 24 wanted to know whether their education had any um, effect on them being in employment at 10 years later. Um, and my, actually, my um, main variable was the um, economic activity, how, how that changes over time. And so each time, the education would be contemporary to the outcome. So here, if we see men, um, and at age 26 to 34, how influential was education level at um, predicting, well, um, at um, putting people in unemployed uh, status versus employed status. So any um, odds ratios lower than one shows that protection of having higher um, education level versus a compar um, reference category of no education or missing, which is a really big um, proportion of, my example, in 1971, you know, that older cohorts, his historical cohort. So this is showing that um, having higher education is protective against not working, basically, um, um, at age 26 to 34 and also 36 to 44. So I have two non-working categories, one for unemployed and one for other inactive, which is everything else that's not inactive. Um, and you can see that the ORs kind of creep upwards for GCSE O level um, um, as people age. Um, and so if we look further down the life course, um, it's still protective um, for those who are unemployed, either inactive at age 46 or 54, but it's no longer so at the very the oldest age group that I have in the 56 to 64, so the oldest transition, should I say. Um, but it is protective at the older ages um, for having higher education, for not working because they're ill. Um, and again, the reference category was to be working. Um, whereas in women, again, OAS um, symptoms lower than one shows protection from being workless. So, so this time we we see the whole entire life course and between 26 to 64, and whether um, education was actually protective um, against being unemployed or other inactive in these ages, um, and it seems to actually strengthen in older age in women. So that means um, people, women with higher education are actually more likely to be working between the age of 46 to 54, um, 64. I would think possibly that's because that's when um, caring load is lower um, in a woman's life course. And, and if you look at the other workless um, category, which is looking after home and family, it's really a very similar picture. So the protection um, is kind of very strange pattern, like a Z-shaped pattern. So protection um, uh, is the weakest in middle life, um, between 36 to 44, and it strengthens again um, at the older ages, 46 to 64. Again, we think that's because um, it's, it's less um, caring load in the, in the household, so women can actually work. Um, so thank you for... Um, for listening. Um, so if you're interested, uh, we'd really like to um, to hear from you. Please get in touch with us um, by email at celsius um, at ucl.ac.uk and, and also I forgot to mention that the support of offer is free. Okay, thank you very much. So we've had a question, how you controlled for other factors influ influence employment. So sorry, I really just had to fly over that. So this is the adjustment that I've made. So we come activity at the last follow up, age group, education level, whether they're married, uh, whether they've reported self um, self reported sickness, um, and that's that applies only in the last two follow ups. Whether there's children in the household, whether there's illness in household members, whether there's spouse working, and also there's a cost of deprivation at the world level. Okay. Okay. Are there any more questions? Okay, it seems that we have provided all the information that was wished. Thank you very much. That's it from us today. And uh, if you have any other questions, please get in touch. We are very happy to answer.
Thank you.